can launch the recording and we will get started. All good. Beautiful. I'm just getting my screens organized, everybody. So, Ben, I do have one poll loaded up, but I'm not, I guess we'll probably launch it at some point. I don't have a slide for it, though, so we'll just decide uh, at whatever point, and then I will ask you to launch that. Um, okay, welcome to session nine of Become a Cybersecurity Ninja. I cannot believe that we have made it this far. We started in January, we are now in May. Anyone who is attending, who has been to every single one of these sessions, first of all, thank you so much. And I hope that you obviously continue to attend, so I guess that's a, a sign that you are getting good input information out of these sessions and finding them worth your time. And we're certainly gonna continue to uh, try to make that true today. Today we're talking about what now? Incident response planning, what to do when something goes sideways at your organization. Here's been our ninja plan. We have covered threat modeling and risk assessment, network security basis, basics, authentication, password managers, encryption, mobile security, working while traveling, phishing, social engineering, digital privacy, security tools, and now what? Incident response. In two weeks, we're going to have a wrap up where we'll just do a very quick summary of everything we covered and some kind of high points around best practices, and most of that time will be dedicated to your Cybersecurity Ninja quiz, and we will have prizes for anyone who aces the quiz, or if no one aces it, we'll give out to the top three scorers of the quiz, and anyone who gets over 80% will get a framed Cybersecurity Ninja certificate sent to you, and uh, we certainly look forward to that. I, of course, am Joshua Pesquet, Vice President of Technology Strategy at Roundtable Technology, and Roundtable Technology is a team of dedicated tech professionals, and we provide all kinds of services to nonprofits and small businesses throughout New York City and Maine, and in fact, the entire world, believe it or not, uh, but mostly uh, New York and Maine. Credit where credit is due. We, I, in researching for this session, I really did not find any Thing that I thought was a good quality kind of incident response planning guide or even article aimed at small businesses and nonprofit organizations. Almost all of the stuff out there is either not very good or not very thorough or is so massively thorough and aimed at, at organizations that have not only entire IT departments, but in fact entire uh, incident response departments <laughs> that, that they weren't applicable. However, this guide from Digital Guardian which is quite recent, was incredibly helpful. We have a link to it in the resources, and I've essentially, uh, with the help of some colleagues, uh, what's the best word, uh, changed this or adopted it, that's the word I'm looking for, Adap uh, I'm sorry, adapted is the word I'm looking for. I've adapted it for small businesses and nonprofit organizations, and hopefully this will now become the resource that will make sense. Asking the question, what's your plan? And I think here, Ben, we'll go ahead and launch the poll and just ask from our audience, if you have anything that is a documented incident response plan. Uh, hopefully we have the poll there, there we go. I'm just curious to know out of the folks attending today, does your organization have a documented incident response plan? And if you're the person responsible or would know, then you can give us an answer and if, you have no idea, then, then that's certainly an option. But I'm just curious to know if any of these organizations attending today, if any of you do have one. We'll go ahead and close that up then and show the results. And we've got uh, about 85%, 86% that either don't have one or don't know if they have one, and a smaller percentage saying that, yes, they do. All right, thank you everybody for that, for that response. And we'll launch back in. So this uh, response plan, which is someone figured out my password and my password was the name of my dog, so now I'm going to rename my dog, would be an example of an incident response plan, but probably not the one that we, that we want. Where to begin to create an incident response plan? And you'll see a lot of, in the, the Digital Guardian Guide, they have a different sort of set of five things. I've kind of redefined some of these to what I think makes sense. And what I also wanted to say about the webinar today is that the timing of it is pretty great, actually, in the sense that we're right on, hopefully, the tail end of the WannaCry 
outbreak, which began last Friday, and Roundtable, which have ha we've had certainly multiple iterations of our own incident response plan and varying degrees of success really executing our response plan when it's time to do so, got a pretty good fire drill this week. And we are, we'll be doing our lessons learned on Thursday morning, but I, you know, a lot of this is really fresh in, in my mind. So that's, and, and in the minds of a lot of round tablers and perhaps many of you. We'll go through each of these. Essentially, your response plan should first of all define what constitutes an incident. In, what, in other words, what are the criteria that cause you to invoke this plan, to say, you know what, this plan is now what we're doing, right? So there's something like a printer jam is probably not enough to invoke your incident response plan, but something like a, a fire that melts your entire server room, if you have a server room, or a malware outbreak that encrypts all of your organization's files is almost certainly enough to invoke the plan. And there's a lot of areas in between those two things that you want to have some idea of what criteria you're using to, to define an incident. Then you want to have some clear process for declaring, hey, we are officially now invoking this plan. This is now what we're doing. And by doing that, and we this this gets to actually communicating and containing are in the wrong order. Communi well, communicating kind of really wraps around this whole thing. If I, if I had a chance to redo this, I would actually have the communicating that's wrapping around all the other things. But communicating that, okay, everybody, if you're part of this team, this is now your number one priority is to be working on this incident response because we have declared an incident. Something's happening. We have to deal with it. Communicating, which happens throughout, and then learning from it, which is, I think, the step that's most easily missed, which is after it's done, saying, okay, what did we learn? What are we going to do differently, if anything? And if so, how are we going to implement those changes? I threw here, in terms of defining the incident, this is a paraphrase I actually copy and pasted from our own incident response, how we define an emergency within Roundtable for our purposes. Because when we declare an emergency, it does cause some different things to happen within Roundtable, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit. And uh, I've, I've removed some of the information here to make it a little more generic. But we have defined these three things as things that would cause an emergency. And these are a work stoppage for the, an entire organization uh, or a critical department of the organization. So if we as Roundtable, uh, have a work stoppage, something that causes us to be unable to work. That would certainly constitute an emergency for us, but we also consider it an emergency if one of our clients has a work stoppage or their finance department essentially is unable to work. And all of these, because we are obviously a very client-focused organization, these emergencies apply both to ourselves and to our clients. We actually use essentially the same process internally and externally. Second, if there's a potential for significant financial loss. And three, if there's significant reputational risk either to us, Roundtable, or to our client, or if our client has significant reputational risk um, for itself. And any of those three are, are what we use. And obviously that's not you know 900 pages of defining terms. We just said these are the things that, if, if one of these three things are happening, then that's an emergency. We are declaring an incident. And that leads you to the next question of declaring an incident, which is how are you going to know that something's happening? How do you become aware that an incident is underway? And I think this is a, a, a real challenge for the small businesses that don't have some of the sophisticated tools that might let you know that something weird is going on on your network or some account has been breached, or other things like data loss prevention that let you know that someone has attempted to remove sensitive information from your network, or what's referred to as egress. And, and the question for a smaller organization is how will you know if, if something's going on? I'll move on soon after I'll keep staring at Whitney Houston there. And here's what I'm gonna say, and this is where I very much adapted this, for organizations of all sizes, and this can be true even if you're just a one-person shop, number one, well, if you're a one-person shop, I suppose this isn't applicable. We'll say if it's a two-person shop or larger. Is one, this sounds really minor and informal, and I, for those of you who have been attending these sessions, hopefully you have come to realize that it's not. 
which is this idea of encouraging people to tell you if something's wrong. If you clicked on an email and something happened and you think, oh gosh, I might have just clicked on a phishing email, I might have just triggered some malware, or I might have just given my credentials to somebody, hey, let your let someone know who can think about whether this is something we need to declare an incident for, at least start investigating, and making sure that that's communicated really clearly across the entire organization. So everybody understands we're not going to yell at you, we're not going to scream at you, but we want to know if something bad happens. That is really, really important to us to know if something bad happens or if you think something bad has happened. And making sure that you don't have, I've referred to this before, as like a shoot the messenger mentality within the organization where people are strongly chastised or told not to bother us when they bring forth problems that are going on. That's that's a huge risk unto itself. So making sure that people know to communicate when something bad's going on. That's, that's one thing that any size organization can do. The second is you can leverage notifications, and I'll show you what I mean in the next slide, but a lot of the online services, Google, Office 365 from Microsoft, Salesforce, Dropbox, they have on the administrative side or even just on the user account side, a lot of notifications you can set up that can tell you about things that might indicate some hanky-panky going on. And that can include notifications, which I'll show you, of failed login attempts, of login attempts from new devices, of login attempts from different geographic locations, which is a super helpful one, of attempts from, uh, or when things happen to devices, so this device rebooted unexpectedly or it ran an update unexpectedly. These are all things that are free to turn on and get notifications for may require a bit of what's called noise signal tweaking, meaning making sure you're not getting so many alerts that you just start ignoring them. I've, I've actually gotten that really in a good place in terms of our Google notifications at, at Roundtable, and it's turned out to be very helpful. Larger organizations, and I'm going to define larger as if you got 50 or more staff, and probably for most of us, you know, 100 or more staff and, and, and even larger, then you can start to consider uh, SIEM or security what the acronym stands for, security inspection, uh, event management uh, tools where they monitor you know, your firewalls and the logs and they can actually detect anomalies in what's going on and send you alerts and then start to manage different security events. Splunk is probably the most popular one. There's a bunch of other ones out there, but that's really for larger organizations. Most of us smaller organizations really wouldn't have the resources to even manage a tool like that. Oops. Looking at this Google detection alert, and this is uh, Office 365 is very similar things. Uh, Google just updated this quite a bit, and, it, and it's really very helpful. And again, Dropbox, Salesforce, they all have a, a lot of these that you can configure, and this does not require having an entire IT department to manage. And this is an actual email, I went ahead and, and redacted some of the, the identifying information here. This is when we got literally, uh, I think a week ago today, no, a week ago yesterday, and it basically told us that someone from our domain logged in in Sebring, Florida, which was a new location to us, and gave us the IP address, gave us the account, and I got this notification, sent it on to my support uh, director, and said, you know, can you look into this and see if, in fact, we have anyone who was in Florida at this moment. We determined relatively quickly that it was, but that actually there were some security things that we could change to make this a less of a problem for us. And without invoking the entire incident response, which we would have if we couldn't have tracked this down because we would have said, well, someone uh, <laughs> attempted to log in or actually succeeded in logging in from, from this. Or I'm sorry, no, this was a login attempt from this location. Uh, but anyway, there's, uh, this is an example of the kind of note. And we get, I've got it, when I first set this up, I was getting like 10 notifications a day. I've got it down to now where I get one notification a week, perhaps, of, of I've, I've kind of gotten rid of the events that I don't consider to be terribly significant. And, you know, it's something that you can do that's free if you're using these cloud-based services. That gets us into, so we talked about defining, identifying that, that, that there is an incident, and now we're declaring. And now we're saying, you know, this is an incident, this is happening. And that's pretty straightforward. 
once we've identified that something's happening, we've been hit with this ransomware attack, our server is down, our internet is out, uh, $5,000 has been wired out of our organization without authorization, uh, we're gonna go ahead and, you know, it satisfies our criteria that we've defined, we're going to declare an incident. You're gonna make it really clear that there's an incident, we're gonna alert the team and we're gonna start talking about the team next. And we're gonna initiate the plan. And the plan is what are all the things that are going to happen from this point forward. That's pretty straightforward and the communication is really the, the main part of that. And I would say in the plan, there probably should be some indication of who in the organization is authorized to actually declare an incident. If you're really small, if you're like a five person organization, you know, it might be that anyone can, can be authorized to declare an incident, but if you're a larger organization, you may want to limit that to a few people, so someone would need to escalate it up and say, hey, this is something that's going on, do we want to officially declare an incident and invoke this plan, or are we just going to kind of treat this as a problem and just kind of work at it like a normal thing? Gathering your troops. So once you've declared the incident, we have an incident response team. The, the templates that you'll see in the report will include identifications little tables for an incident response team it'll say here are the people and their responsibilities for this you would certainly want to have someone who's managing it that's the person whose fundamental job is communication and prioritization they are communicating with everybody who needs to be communicated with about what's happening what needs to happen additional resources that may be needed the prioritization of actions they're the ones they're the person who's managing it and it's kind of like a project manager in the sense of, of the role. A lot of communications, a lot of prioritization, a lot of managing resources to, to deal with the issue. Obviously, you're going to need your technicians, your security analysts. If you don't, if you have these within your staff, and I'll talk about this in an upcoming slide, you wanna make sure you at least know who those are. So if you're outsourced to Roundtable, then you're clear, you contact Roundtable, and Roundtable hopefully would get the right people on the job for you. And you want to have other folks, threat researchers or other people who may have jobs to do involved as well. But gathering the troops, declaring the incident, getting everybody rolling. This is where it gets even trickier, and I don't mean to make this overly complex for folks. But depending on the nature of the incident, there may be involvement from technical and non-technical teams. An incident where, let's say, your IT director turned out to be defrauding your organization, uh, or let's say died suddenly, or uh, an employee is engaging in significantly malicious behavior and you think is you know, either stealing information or money from the organization, or you have a data breach of highly sensitive information about donors or customers, and and it's pretty clear you're going to need to communicate to those customers or donors that their information has been breached, then you're going to need to involve potentially, right, a PR department, if you, and if you don't have one, whoever's in that role for external communications. You may have to involve your human resources. You may need legal help to determine what you can and can't do legally in this scenario. And you'd ideally not like to be scrambling to locate resources with whom you've never worked before at this very moment when you're undergoing an emergency. You'd like to have some notion of who those resources will be and have confidence that when you call them and say, we are undergoing an emergency and we need your help right now, that they will be able to help you in that scenario, at least in some reasonable time frame. And you don't want to have, you know, a lawyer that you have on retainer, but it's a single person. And the day you call them with their emergency, they're like, look, you only call us like once every two years. You've done like $200 worth of business. And I have just totally booked up this week. So I really can't help you have that conversation before you're actually in the middle of an emergency that you need legal help with. Hopefully that makes sense. And it may take a village, right? So you might also need, the larger your organization, the more complex the issue. You may need help with your executives. If you're a nonprofit, you may need to talk to your board. It, you may need, again, human resources. You may need 
public relations experts, and of course, you, you're going to need the technical resources. And everybody tends to focus on the technical resources, but all these other components may come into it, again, depending on the nature of the incident and whether it's going to have legal or PR repercussions uh, based on the kind of breach that you've had. And so build those relationships, sorry, I, I covered this before, but build those relationships before you're in the midst of an emergency. I really highly, highly recommend uh, building those relationships ahead of time. And for, for those of you who have roundtables uh, or are clients of roundtable, you've got the technical piece covered in terms of working with roundtable, but those other pieces we may or may not be able to help you with. And you'll want to think about if you are going to need help with those things, who would you go to? So here's the cartoon, and I'll, I'll take this moment to kind of talk about how this played out this week with WannaCry and Roundtable. We did not formally declare a, an emergency or an incident at Roundtable based on what was going on with WannaCry. And there wasn't a ton of conversation about that at Roundtable. It probably would have been my call to declare it, and based on what I was reading around the how it was spreading and what it was doing, it seemed to me that our clients were at pretty low risk of, of being affected by this and that the biggest problem we had was a communications problem, was that our clients were going to be reading about it in the news and were going to probably on Monday morning start asking us questions about it and that is in fact what happened. And we thought it would be a good idea to get out ahead of that and, and sent out some proactive communications very early on Monday and put information on our website to help both our clients and to help our technicians so that they could direct people to that information. But there were some other things where clients were asking us to check on certain things where we, we did discover some, some capacity limitations in terms of our abilities to validate you know, that, that a particular machine was at a current patch level really quickly. We were able to do it, but not as quickly and easily as we would have liked. And some other challenges with our communications. And so it did wind up being a bigger burden for our team such that we may have, in retrospect, wanted to declare an incident. You know, but it was really hard to tell because it all happened over the weekend and we weren't sure how many calls we were going to get until Monday came around and then a lot of those calls started coming in. So there was a degree to which we were all running around in circles going, what do we do, what do we do, and a degree to which we were pretty good in terms of being proactive about it. And again, we're going to do our own lessons learned on Thursday, but it gives you a kind of idea of this nebulous area. If, if I had been reading about this on Saturday, and on Saturday we'd been getting support tickets flooding in of people saying that they were you know, affected by this ransomware by WannaCry, and we could look at our queue and see that we had 20 tickets in of people either saying we've been infected or asking, you know, for information before Monday even rolled around, then it would have been no problem to declare an emergency and say, okay, we've got, you know, clearly reputational stuff around table going on, all these things. But that wasn't happening, so we had to make a call. But that gives you an idea of the kind of thought process that, that we go through. Got my own quote here. I had another quote in here, and I didn't like it. And I thought I would share something. And this is a policy change that we made, and it's part of our incident response plan at Roundtable. And I, I, this has been a very important change for us, and I'll explain what this means. When we have an emergency going on at a client, and we changed this, I want to say, about a year ago, what we learned is that we have a technician working really intensely, and sometimes multiple technicians working really intensely on a problem. So let's say that a network suddenly goes down and we determine that the internet's fine, we determine that the server's fine, but meanwhile you've got 50 people in the middle of a workday that have no connection to their own network and we're, we have engineers frantically looking at the firewall, looking at the switches, trying to figure out what's going on in the network to, to cause it. And that sometimes can, can take a little effort and they have to be very focused on that. Meanwhile, the client rightfully is wondering what's going on what's our eta what's happening can someone please tell me what's happening and the engineers who are trying to focus on the ground line they cannot communicate effectively and also work effectively on the problem and obviously 
we want them to work effectively on the problem. And the change that we made is we said, okay, when we have an incident with a client, when we declare an emergency with a particular client, we are then immediately assigning a project manager in the role of communications around this incident. And that project manager will talk to the engineers as little as they possibly can to get an update on the situation that allows them to explain to the client what's happened, what we've done so far, what we are doing, and without any promise that we can't keep an ETA for when we think we'll either have a resolution or if we have no idea when we're going to have a resolution, an ETA for when we'll have an update on you know, how bad or how solved the problem is. And that has been a monumental change for us to have that kind of dedicated communications in that role that really helps everybody communicate better. And I can't, I don't want to get so long-winded here, there are so many problems where in, after we do a lessons learned with the client after the incident, they've said something like, well, gosh, if I'd known that we were spending four hours trying to fix this $300 device that we could have just bought a new one, I would have just had you buy the new one. And I wish someone would have talked to me or communicated options to me in the midst of this. And that's really hard when you're in the midst of an emergency, but executives really want to have the kind of full, you know, the full availability of what are, what are our options for, uh, you know, spending money to solve the problem or allowing time to pass to solve the problem or workarounds to solve the problem. They want all the options available and the engineers will sometimes just make assumptions. Well, they're not going to want to spend, you know, $5,000 on a new server. They'd rather us fix this one. And those assumptions can sometimes be, be very incorrect. If it's a breach, if it is a security breach, if it's malware, if it's something like that, containment is really, really important. We want to make sure that we keep the little rascals contained in whatever systems they're in. This one's pretty basic, but I think can be missed a lot. Shut down and disconnect any compromised systems. If you have a system with malware, you know, get it off your network as soon as possible. Collect important data about you know, the incident from whatever you can. So if you've got malware that's detected it, if you've got logs, you know, make sure that you're making that data available. Any external intelligence, a lot of this is simply talking to people and learning what did you click on, when did you click on it, uh, when did you open the attachment, what was it from, you know, who, uh, all these kinds of things. Just talking to people, what happened, and reviewing the logs for those things. It's making sure that your backups and things like that are secure. And if you're concerned that, you know, this malware is sort of spreading through your network, you may want to actually disconnect backup drives, things like that from your network to make sure that the, the malware isn't able to go and, and overwrite those backups. And of course, collecting logs of, of everything that's happened and not uh, deleting logs. A lot of systems, Windows servers, firewalls are set to overwrite logs every 24 hours or every 72 hours just so that they don't fill up space and be unable to log. And in an incident, you want to go check those log settings and stop them from overwriting uh, until you're clear with the incident and then you can set them back to their normal state. And then that's something that's more for the technical folks, but it's, it's a good note. And I realize I'm running a little bit long here, which is surprising because I'm by myself this week, but I'm uh, apparently being extra long-winded. Create your incident classification framework. There's a kind of classification, category type severity, and then a taxonomy, and this all sounds super technical, so let me just break it down for you based on a recent one uh, with WannaCry, and this is if someone got infected. So the category is malware, the type is ransomware, which is a specific type of, of malware, the severity is high. If, if we were had our files encrypted by this, we would say that's a pretty severe problem. The detection method was user notification, meaning someone clicked the email and a message came up and said all your files are encrypted and you have to pay $3,000 to get them, I think it was $300 in this case, $300, and they told us. The attack vector is how did this get in? Well, the user told us they clicked on the email, so we'll say that's a phishing email. The impact is file availability. We haven't lost data because we have backups in this instance, but the files are temporarily unavailable because they've been encrypted. The intent is malicious of a financial nature. Someone's trying to extort money from us. The data exposed, to the best of our knowledge, is none. The data was encrypted, but we don't believe the data was egressed or extracted from our network, and we have no reason to believe that our data has been exposed. 
the root cause, two root causes, user error and lack of patch management, meaning we didn't have patch management, and we can debate about root cause, but we could say that the root cause for the, if we back up, right, if we do like a five whys exercise for the user clicking on the phishing email, we could say, well, because the user didn't have security awareness training and wasn't given opportunities to learn about how phishing emails work and why they wouldn't click on them. We could do another why and say, well, why haven't done well because the organization hasn't prioritized providing security awareness training or the organization provided it, but the staff person was too busy to attend it and wasn't prioritized properly to do that. And you can keep going backwards. And the same for patch management. Well, why didn't we have a patch management system? Because it cost $3,000 a year and we didn't want to spend that. And why didn't we prioritize the budget, so on and so forth. But root cause generally just, you're trying to identify what, what were the basics of, of how this happened. This is Tim Bandos. This is the guy who wrote the, the Digital Guardian. Uh, this is some more technical stuff that he has in terms of tips. Uh, number two, I really love never let a good incident go to waste, meaning always do a lessons learned and figure out, okay, what can we learn from this? What could we have done differently? Is this something that's totally anomalous or is it something that could repeat? Be sure to reset credentials for any critical things anytime this happens, meaning change administrative passwords and all that stuff. If you've been compromised, you want to assume that, you know, all these things might be compromised. And communication within and across teams can't say enough about how important that is and how hard that is. It is really hard when you are in the middle of a major incident to keep communication happening within and across teams. But it is so important and I have done, fortunately not a ton of these, but probably a dozen or so lessons learned following incidents. I've never done one that I can think of where a lot of the talk was about things that were not communicated well during. And a lot of the problems were because, oh, I didn't know you were doing that. Oh, I didn't know that was an option that we could do. Oh, I didn't realize this person had that data in a different place. I didn't know this person was available to us to help. Always a huge amount of focus in the, in the aftermath of these things around communication. And here's our wrap up. In the learning, complete your incident report. I have a, a Google form for an incident report template that you can fill out. It's just five, I believe five questions, and that's in the resources. Identify any preventative measures that you want to add to your environment. Monitor post-incident. Make sure things in, you know, are in fact okay. If there's any changes you're going to make, make sure you get buy-in with your organization for the, why you're doing those changes. And then, of course, update your incident response plan to reflect those things. Uh, one last thing is to kind of understand your organization's priorities. Determine what matters most and ensure that the response reflects those priorities. So if, the, if Roundtable says, you know, our number one priority is to make sure that our customers are, are communicated with clearly and that they feel that, you know, confident that we're being proactive, then let's ensure that, you know, we're not spending a ton of time doing uh, documentation behind the scenes and we're not off changing passwords and, and doing all this backend stuff without communicating to clients what we're doing and without making sure that the clients understand what we are and what we aren't doing uh, so that they have that level of confidence and, and feel if we say that's a priority if we say it's a priority to you know keep everything completely in the dark and we don't want anyone to know what we're doing then you know that's a different priority but it, it differs across different organizations Key success factors, plan, declare, stay calm, hint, having a plan helps with that. Communicate, and again, I would wrap that around this whole thing, learn. And here are our resources. The Incident Responders Field Guide, that is the, the link that I showed you about, of the Roundtable Incident Response Form. I'll go ahead and click on this just to show you guys sort of what this looks like. It'll just pop open a Google form. Oh, I have the wrong link in there, obviously. All right, so I'll have to fix that. Sorry about that, everybody. We'll fix that link uh, before. I think I should have it here. Let me see if I can find this very quickly. Uh, incident report. This is the roundtable one, but there's uh, the one I, I use is a sort of shared one. Um, so here's what this, this looks like if, if you want to kind of complete this. Um, so it's basically, an issue summary, right? State the impact, what, what happened, the timeline, the root cause, resolution and recovery, corrective preventive measures, and any additional comments. And this is something that when we have incidents, we have our personnel fill out so that we have a clear incident response documented uh, within the, uh, within the organization. And I think 
that is it. Two weeks from today, the wrap up, the Cybersecurity Ninja Certification Quiz, and anyone who aces the quizzes, who aces the quiz, will get a prize worth at least fifty bucks. We'll have a, a set of things you can get, and maybe we'll do Amazon certificates if you don't want any of those things. But we'll have. Um, I, I had the list when we first set this up in January. I think it was a uh, a Canary, which is a sort of home security system. Uh, we'll offer a YubiKey, which is a universal two-factor authentication token that you can carry around with you and a couple other things that we'll offer and then probably just Amazon gift cert, which is probably what most you'll take, but the other ones will be worth more money than that. And scores of 80% or better will get a framed cybersecurity ninja certificate with your name on it. And if uh, and if the scores are lower than expected, then we will we'll go to a curve for both the prizes and, and the certification. And with that, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and enter them into your questions box in the survey. I don't see any that have come in yet. And thank you so much for coming. And I look forward to seeing folks back here in two weeks for the quiz and the wrap up of this uh, epic 10 part ninja training. All right. uh, I don't see any questions so far. A few thank yous. And if I'll wait around for another minute or so, and if not, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. See, I see Christian here from Roundtable. Christian, do you have any questions? Can I unmute you? I can probably unmute you if you want. Let's see. Nope, he's good. All right. All right, well, thank you, everybody. We're going to wrap, and I look forward to seeing everybody back here in two weeks. Bye-bye.